All right. Good morning. Thank you all for joining us today as we are going to be continuing our Sunday school study on the last days. Last week we looked at post-millennialism and today we're going to look at all millennialism. So we are going to uh, be covering, once again, similar format. If you, if you watched uh, last uh, Sunday or if you were uh, with us last Sunday, we looked at uh, first and foremost the case for post-millennialism. And then uh, we looked at some of the reasons why I am not a uh, proponent of it. We're going to do the same thing today. So we're going to start out giving all millennialism the benefit of the doubt. And then we're going to uh, go forward and look at some of the reasons why I don't hold to it, okay? And then here in a moment, I may have to fiddle with my mic. And if you hear any static or extra noise, please let me know. Are y'all hearing it right now? Okay. All righty. So uh, with that, let me uh, open us up in a word of prayer. And then we'll uh, get started. But I'll give Chuck just a moment to get set down because he doesn't want to have to do the quick jog. By the way, I'll, I'll mention he came to visit us today uh, all the way from Mountain Western Oklahoma. So glad to have him. All right, let's open up a word of prayer. Lord, thank you so much for this time that we have to study your word. I thank you for those that are here with us today. As we look at this important matter of the last days and continuing to uh, discuss this topic of doctrine, Lord, I pray that we would uh, search the scriptures to understand what uh, it has to say about this and understand how important it truly is for our uh, understanding of uh, the times that we live in today. And with that, we ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right, so all millennialism. Let's look at our uh, nice little graphic that I made for you. There it is. I'm going to try putting it on my back pocket because I tried to put it in my front pocket, and uh, maybe that's better. We'll see. So all millennialism, I've got this nice graphic for you here. On, on the left side, you're going to kind of see the blue trending more into red. That is roughly, if you just take kind of an average of the all millennialist view, that's kind of their idea of things. Uh, the blue represents the age of the church, if you will. And on the graphic, you'll see that the blue continues all the way to the very end, but it just uh, is starting to get overwhelmed with red. And red is our sign uh, signifier, indicator of tribulation hard times. So the idea behind the amillennial view is that during that church age, and once again, they'll use the term church and body of Christ indistinguishably, okay? Um, I discern between those two. I don't think they always mean the same thing, but amillennialists, they just kind of throw it all into the blender and that's what they get. But with that, the church age continues up to the second coming, but so does tribulation. However, tribulation is going to increase. It's going to wax worse towards the very end. Then you have the second coming of Christ, and then you have eternity. Notice that there is something lacking in the all-millennial view, and that is there's no rapture, okay? There's no rapture doctrine with an all-millennialist. And furthermore, what we need to also uh, keep in mind is millennial, millennium. That refers to the thousand-year reign of Christ mentioned in Revelation chapter 20. All millennialists do not believe in a physical future reign of Christ on earth. That's why they have the awe in front of millennial. Awe means not millennial. Now, let's go ahead and uh, consider some other uh, matters of this. One, one characteristic of amillennialism is because they do take the kingdom to not be physical and future, but more spiritual, Christ reigning in the hearts of believers, they're also going to take a, a lot of other aspects about the last days, whether it is the tribulation, the Antichrist, wars, natural disasters, all those various things, and they will very much tend to interpret those figuratively as well, okay? And that really is kind of the heart of the, the first two views we've looked at, both, both post and amillennial are going to have a much more figurative view of the Bible. It's not until we get into the premillennial camp where we start taking a more literal interpretation of the scriptures, okay? So with that being said, I want to make note for you, though, that post-millennialism and amillennialism are similar but not the same. So as we are going through this study here, you may see some things last week and you'll think, well, that's the same thing post-millennialism believes. And to a degree, that's true. You're going to see some similar overlap, all right? Um, however, you're going to see that there are some key distinctions as well, okay? Um, both of these views are pretty popular. Postmillennialism is, I think, maybe even growing in popularity in today's time. I, I once upon a time thought that it was kind of a more 
uh, obscure view, not as many people held, but as I've started doing some more investigation, some reading, there's actually kind of a resurgence in the post-millennial view. And then amillennialism is another very popular view. It's been around for a very long time as well, and a lot of people hold to it. If you get into more of like the traditional Protestants, for example, like the Presbyterians and some of those, they're going to trend to the amillennial view compared to the postmillennial view. And so with that, let's uh, consider this going on a little bit further. Um, at first glance, they can seem to be almost indiscernible, like you're splitting hairs. But uh, th that's really because they both reject Christ's physical return to earth. That is the major common factor that they agree on. They believe that Christ is not going to come physically to reign. He is reigning already right now from heaven. So there's not going to be a future day in which Jesus is going to be king actually in Israel. Okay, uh, the, the post or the premillennial view is that Christ is going to physically reign on the throne of David within the city of Jerusalem. There will come a day that you can take a boat, a plane, however, and you can travel to Israel and he will be there. That's not the post-millennial or amillennial view. Um, now, let's talk about how they are different though, okay? And this is a big, a big difference, so make note of this. While postmillennialism is the optimistic view, you'll recall that postmillennials believe that ultimately Christ is going to have victory during his reign, which in part we'll see how they're right about that, but where they get it wrong is what they mean by the kingdom. But they have an optimistic view that of, you know, in the last days, the vast majority, if not all, of the world is going to be saved. Okay, And so that's the optimistic view. Then you have the amillennials who do affirm, no, 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 there, there's not going to come a day when most of the world or all of the world is saved. Rather, tribulations are going to persist until Christ returns. That's the amillennial view. So they're very different from each other. And it's kind of funny, they don't, I'm speaking kind of generalities here, right? Because I'm saying they, and y'all don't even know who they is. And I don't always like it when they do that, when they say this and when they say that. <laughs> But if we're just kind of lumping them into one big whole, the post-millennials and all-millennials kind of don't like each other. Uh, there's kind of some friction there uh, between, between those, kind of maybe even like the pre-tribulational rapture people versus the post-tribulation rapture people, right? So they'll butt some heads on that matter. Now, let's uh, look at the arguments for all-millennialism, okay? Let's go ahead and look at their case that they make. Now, Unfortunately, or fortunately, some of our work is already done for today, because if you'll recall, some of those same arguments that are made for postmillennialism concerning a figurative kingdom or a spiritual kingdom is present within amillennialism as well. So you're going to see that. It's foundational to their doctrine, okay? It is absolutely essential to a postmillennial and an amillennial alike that the kingdom is spiritual. So you definitely will have, but this is true within other camps as well, a lot of kingdom language. They'll talk about adding to the kingdom. They'll talk about building the kingdom, growing the kingdom, doing kingdom work. So if you hear a, a, a preacher talking that way, he really gets it from the all-millennial or post-millennial, even though he may not personally hold that view, because sometimes we just like to repeat things that sound good. Uh, kind of like the Nicene Creed. Some Christians think it sounds really good, so they like to repeat it, or the Apostles' Creed, whichever you may uh, be familiar with. Uh, so with that being said, it is essential that they have a spiritual kingdom, or at the very least, the kingdom is not Christ exercising government authority on earth. He is reigning from heaven above, and it's the believer's job to carry out the will of Christ on earth. That's going to be their view of it. So it's a lot like postmillennialism, and they're going to utilize verses from both the Hebrew and the Greek scriptures. So you will recall that really uh, flagship verse that is used by the postmillennialist, which is Psalms 110 verse 1, says, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. So there's the, the verse they use out of Psalms. You're going to sit at my right hand. We do know that when Christ ascended, he sat down at the right hand of God the Father. We get that from Hebrews chapter 1. And so Christ is reigning, seated at the right hand, and then he will eventually have victory. That is their view. So they would use similar verses such as that. They would maybe also use uh, 
uh, the passage out of Luke that the kingdom of heaven uh, is, not, is within you. It's a phrase that Jesus uh, mentions here. I don't have it in your notes, but if we do go over to Luke, I believe it's Luke chapter 21. And I may be wrong here, so if not, I'm just going to tell you this is what it says. So I don't think it's that one. Maybe it's Luke chapter 17, and if not, then I'm going to uh, stop talking and we're just going to move on for you. But Luke chapter 17, yes, Luke chapter 17, verse 21. So sometimes I am mentally dyslexic. It's, it was either 21 verse 17 or 17 verse 21. But this is uh, what it says. This is a conversation that Jesus has with the uh, Pharisees. And when he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. Neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. That's Luke chapter 17, verses 20 through 21. So that is a strong passage that they will use to defend, Look, the kingdom of heaven, it's not physically around us. No, it's Christ reigning in your heart. So, like I mentioned with post-millennialism, and this is an important thing you need to keep in mind, there's been a lot of intelligent theologians that have held this view. Okay, Now, I'm not saying that I agree with them because they're intelligent theologians, but I can acknowledge when somebody is intelligent. There's a lot of intelligent people that I disagree with. Okay, uh, Elon Musk is a pretty intelligent guy, but I don't agree with everything that he believes either. So with that, you need to keep in mind they are going to have some compelling arguments. They're going to have some verses, they're going to have some passages that they will use to, um, to build their case, to support their doctrine, to support their theology. And so you need to keep that in mind. They, they have had a lot of time to uh, refine their arguments because, once again, it's been a major view in a lot of seminaries and denominations and churches. So they've really been able to uh, how, how do I put it? They, they, they've kind of prettied it up, right? They've been able to make sure it looks as presentable, as uh, legitimate as possible, because they genuinely believe it. Once again, also with post-millennialism, all millennialism is going to believe that the church is the true Israel. They'll use that term a lot, the true Israel, right? Or the spiritual Israel, the spiritual children of Abraham. And that is going to be a central theme, all right? Now, I've mentioned before, I discern between those. I do not think that Israel is the same thing as the body of Christ. And I don't think the body of Christ is the same thing as Israel. I think these things are separated. They have their promises. They have their program. We have our promises. We have our program. That's how I understand the scriptures. So if we consider all millennialism, there is a lot of overlap. And it has some of the similar points that post-millennialism has okay so if you remember that series or our study last time or you watched it or if you haven't watched it yet that's available to you to watch so as we go from here let's look at case number one so this is a very particular one the millennium is figurative notice i didn't say that the kingdom is figurative the millennium is figurative when i mean millennium we're talking about this passage out of revelation chapter 20 verse 6 revelation chapter 20 verse 6 this is after the very famous triumphant chapter in the book of revelation when christ comes and he has victory over the beast the antichrist the false prophet they're cast into the uh, to the lake of fire and then it talks about the first resurrection, the, the martyrs for the sake of Christ. It says, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. That is the prophecy spoken of in Revelation chapter 20. So Christ will reign these people that are resurrected will reign with Christ for a thousand years. That's where we get the millennium view. Well, a major case in point that the all millennials make is that is not a literal thousand years. The, the kingdom does not last that long. It, it's just a term to mean a long time. Now, if we compare that to post-millennialism, there are some post-millennialists that will actually say, well, no, that, that could be a literal thousand years. Their view is that when most of the world or all of the world is saved and Christ is having his perfect will done on earth and Christianity is in pos uh, prosperity, that will last for a thousand years. And that is the reign. 
So some post-millennials will actually hold to a literal thousand years, a time in which all the world is saved and everything's good. The amillennialist says absolutely not. That, that phrase a thousand years is figurative for just a really long time. That is their view on that. So it's a central doctrine for them as well. They have to reject a thousand years. Um, and and uh, with that, they argue, and I kind of basically repeated myself in that middle section, but this view argues that the Bible hardly speaks of a thousand-year reign, except for that one time in Revelation 20, so it's not a strong argument. And they do make a point. You don't find in the Bible, other than that Revelation chapter 20 passage, about the kingdom lasting a thousand years. It's only in that Revelation 20 verse 6 that you have, to my understanding, and I'll gladly be corrected because it would help my case, but... They argue that you just have the thousand years mentioned in Revelation 20, verse 6, and Revelation is not being literal when it mentions it. And like I said, they just mean that it is a really long time. And for them, this is, this is a hill that they live or die on because the millennialist says the kingdom started essentially when Christ ascended. When Christ ascended into heaven, that's when the kingdom started. Now, there was probably a time <laughs> uh, before they ran out of years that they may have believed that the thousand years were literal. The issue for them now, if you're an amillennialist, is it's been well over a thousand years since Christ ascended into heaven and the spiritual kingdom started. So they can't hold to a literal thousand years because, well, we're well past that point. So what they have to do is they have to say, no, it, it just means a really long time. And they argue, due to Revelation's figurative language, all millennialism uh, seeks to justify this argument, justify this position. For example, if we go to Revelation chapter 12, verse 1, I'll go ahead and turn there so I can read a little bit more for you. But if you've, uh, has anybody ever read the book of Revelation? Did anybody find it extremely confusing? Very good, yes. <laughs> You're not alone. <laughs> so, Revelation is a very challenging book. There's definitely a lot of imagery, a lot of figurative language used. For example, Revelation chapter 12, verse 1. And I stood, um, no, that's uh, verse 13, uh, chapter 13, verse 1, I apologize, a typo there. That verse is Revelation 13, verse 1. So in your Bibles, it says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns and upon his head the name of blasphemy. It's quite the image to try to even picture. How do you picture a beast with uh, seven heads and ten horns? Does, does some of the heads not have a horn, or does every head have ten horns? I, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> ten horns. Now, with that, as we go on, in verse, tw uh, verse 2 it says, And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power, and his seat and great authority. So now we have a dragon in this whole picture. Revelation certainly has a lot of imagery. With that being said, they make the argument that because Revelation has so much figurative language, then you... Uh, you cannot take that thousand years to be literal. For example, here's another one. Um, Revelation 17, verse 3. It's not going to be up here on the screen, but I'll read it to you. Revelation 17, verse 3. So this is John talking about the angel. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast full of the names of blasphemy having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman w was arrayed in purple and fine scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup on her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. So Revelation, once again, lots of imagery there, lots of figurative language. So once again, they make the case you cannot just take that thousand years as a literal span of time. It has to just mean a long time. Now, here's case number two. And this is where I actually would agree with them, okay? So just because they're making a case doesn't mean I think they're wrong about this. Case number two, and this is really to argue against the post-millennialist, is that the last days include tribulation, okay? And this is where the amillennials at least do a good job acknowledging this fact, okay? So, for example, you have 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. 
and it says, uh, know also, uh, this know also that in the last days... Uh, perilous times shall come. It goes on and says in the chapter, For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. It doesn't stop there. Verse 4, Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Goes on, talks about now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, that would be the magicians of Pharaoh, so do also uh, these also resist the truth, men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. Goes on describing these last days, perilous times shall come. You can read in the book of Revelation when it starts, uh, we'll, we'll get to that point where we read about the vials and, uh, and the scroll and all of these things that unfolds. But amillennialism does a very good job of not denying this. Postmillennialism, because they take that optimistic view, they have to take all those verses and put them in the past. Their view is that all those prophecies of tribulation and suffering and wrath took place back in the uh, first century, whether it was with Nero or some of the persecution by the Jews, you name it, that is when all that tribulation took place. The issue is the Bible is just time and time again, very upfront, in the last days, these times are going to come. You also have the testimony in Matthew chapter 24, which is really kind of a mini revelation given by Jesus. And it describes these things right here. Um... Jesus is uh, talking here and says, uh, oh, I could start anywhere in the chapter. I'm going to have to cut myself off because I can't read the whole thing. But Jesus says, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let, him, let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. But woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor no, nor ever shall be. So it describes that time of great tribulation, great suffering that is to come. Once again, postmillennialism has to argue, and I would say quite weakly, that all that took place in the past. And in order to argue all that took place in the past, you have to greatly, greatly take a lot of uh, liberty with biblical interpretation. You have to argue so much of it is figurative, so much of it is spiritual, that uh, I think it undermines so much of the Bible. All millennialism, to their credit, they say, no, no, no. There is going to be tribulation all the way up to the end. So amillennialism and premillennialism does share in this similarity, okay? Um, and what's kind of funny is you have sort of an interesting type of paradox. Um, on one hand, let's just talk about this. On one hand, amillennialism does hold to some degree of end times tribulation. We would agree with that, or I would agree with that. However, amillennialism rejects a time of victory and prosperity for the kingdom, because the kingdom is always going to have tribulation. Well, I reject that because the Bible describes that when the kingdom comes, Christ is going to be victorious. Guess which view also has a view of a victorious kingdom? Postmillennialism but they don't agree in a future physical reign of Christ. So it's interesting to me how you look at these different views, and there's enough truth in the Word of God that these views will actually understand some of it. They just can't quite put it all together. And uh, I believe my position, pre-tribulational, pre-millennialism, actually does put it all together to where it does tie everything in, in and make sense. But that is an interesting point. So with that being said... Don't just assume, because somebody has a theology or a doctrine that you don't agree with, that you can't learn something from them. You may not agree with their doctrine entirely. There's a lot of theologians out there that I don't agree with in their entirety. Um, I, I've been listening. I've been slowly working through it. But uh, John Locke's Two Treatises of Civil Government, uh, I've just been listening to it, not reading it. 
Um, I wouldn't agree with the theology of John Locke, but he's made some very interesting points as he argues for the matter of each man having individual liberty and uh, there's no such thing as a divine right of kings and things like that. So uh, be, be kind of studious, be curious and uh, look and see what these different positions hold because you may just find a little bit of uh, support for your own view mixed in with some of their confusion. Now uh, with that, some of them are going to disagree in, in some areas, but not necessarily in others. Now, in regard to the tribulation, let's talk about that matter. This view, talking about all millennialism, all right? I wonder how many times I'm going to say ism in the course of this entire series. I feel like I've said it just nonstop. This view usually, usually rejects a literal seven-year tribulation, okay? That's going to be, by and large, the consensus. There may be a few all millennialists out there that will argue, yeah, those last seven years will get really bad. But I haven't found many of them. Uh, by and large, the tribulation and the seven years, uh, that, that's all figurative. Instead, the tribulation, it, 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 it's occurred since Christ's ascension, and it's going to simply increase in the last days. It's just going to, it's like a, you're turning up the volume, or you know, you got the frog in the pot, and you're turning up the heat to boil it all the more. So furthermore, under that amillennialist view, they may not necessarily hold to a future coming of the Antichrist. Some may, some may not, okay? If you hear people being extremely concerned about the Antichrist, for one, they're not post-millennial, uh, they're not post-millennial and they're probably not amillennial either. Uh, so just keep that in mind. That's some common features because once again, they take a lot of things figuratively which means that the amillennialist may not really be worried about a seven-year tribulation or, a, or the Antichrist coming and setting up a one-world order, okay? Just so you have a little bit more familiarity and understand them just a little bit. Another major point of amillennialism, whatever view of the, of the uh, tribulation they have, whether it is seven years or it's just the ever-increasing persecution of the church, throughout history, believers must endure the tribulation, okay? Whatever that tribulation entails, the amillennialist view is that you're going to go through it. If you are a believer, if you're a part of the church, body of Christ, they, it's all the same thing to them, you will have to go through the tribulation, okay? The postmillennialists, they'll say, well, that took place a long time ago. We may have a little bit of suffering today, but overall things are really good. That's kind of their view of things. The amillennialists will say, no, nope, we're going to endure it. You're going to have to go through it. So just, you know, uh, suck it up, buttercup is kind of their mentality, right? Now, uh, let's talk about, now that I've given you somewhat of a decent presentation of it, I've tried to be fair, giving the arguments that they have. Obviously, I could, I could spend a lot longer. The truth being is that if I was to go through all the arguments that they make for amillennialism, I would have to do a whole series on it because there's a lot to it. And uh, that's not the point of this series. The point of this series is to give you just a good overall understanding of people's different opinions of the last days, okay? And so hopefully this will be beneficial for you, especially I know that we've got some in here that have some youngsters and uh, that y'all uh, engage with on a regular basis because they live with you and they're your children. And uh, <laughs> they have lots of questions. And hopefully by the time it's all said and done, or whether you've got grandkids or what have you, you can be able to explain these things to them. Uh, I remember when I was quite young, we, it was in the springtime, and I may have told you this story before, but I'm you know, 29 years old now. I'm, as we get older, we repeat our stories. <laughs> but I remember it rained for a really long time, like three days straight, just nothing but rain. And I was very concerned, and I thought that maybe we started the thousand-year reign of Christ. And uh, I told my parents that. They said, no, 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 let me explain. That's not, it's not a RAI in reign. <laughs> so anyways, uh, but this may help you with that. But let's talk a little bit, just a little bit, about the amillennial problem. I'm not going to... Uh, today I would not persuade an amillennial that they're wrong. But as we move forward in this study, and I start addressing more matters of the tribulation, the kingdom, you name it, I think I'm going to make a, a much stronger case for what uh, I hold to. But let's talk about it. First and foremost, because all, millennial, all millennialism and post-millennialism are so similar, okay, 
they are going to suffer from many of the same issues. And therefore, the problems that persist in amillennialism are going to persist in postmillennialism. It requires a figurative interpretation of much within Scripture. And I think maybe I'm underemphasizing the word much. When you decide that you're going to interpret the kingdom to be spiritual, not literal, not physical, not future, the return of Christ is not literal, physical, and future. I'm, good. I'm just going to say conservatively, 80% of this book becomes a figurative, mystical document. Uh, that really is the truth of the matter. You cannot take the Bible literally and have a consistent, concise interpretation and reject a future physical kingdom. And when the Bible becomes a figurative, mystical book, it can mean a thousand different things to any person at any given time. And I think that's what hap that's happened to churches today because so many churches, when they do Bible study, um, a phrase comes up very, very often that uh, you've heard me talk about before. But that phrase is, what does that verse mean to you? And that becomes the heart of Bible study. It's sitting around in a circle looking at one another and telling each other what that verse means to you. The problem is, it doesn't really matter what that verse means to you. What matters is what does the verse mean? And uh, I know that we may have our favorite Bible verses. I used to have uh, on my baseball glove, because that's what everybody did, I wrote a Bible verse on my, on my glove. And everybody does Philippians 4.13. Um, and doctrinally, that's probably a little bit better than what I did, but still we're kind of taking that out of context whenever we apply it to our success in sports. But I thought, you know what, I'm going to be different. So I did a, I did a search on the Internet uh, during my computer class when I was supposed to be typing. And uh, I looked up uh, victorious Bible verses. And I found one, something like Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 9 or something like that. And it says, the Lord will go before you and he will fight your enemies and bring you victory. And I thought, that's the one I want on my, on my, uh, my baseball glove. So I, I wrote in big letters with a sharpie, Deuteronomy 4.9 or whatever the verse is. Um, but that is kind of what we do in Bible study. We just, we find a verse we like, we talk about how much it means to us, and then we just go on our day. But we don't actually learn about the Bible that way. Um, we, we have to sit down and we have to have a real mature discussion about what these words really do mean. And therefore, my position is, if we're going to make the Bible figurative, you might as well just build your own religion at that point. And I think that's what a lot of Christianity has maybe unfortunately done. They built a lot of their own doctrine, a lot of their own theology. And uh, the, the God that they've kind of made up in their heads, not exactly the God of the Bible. Um, so I just really, I really have a problem with the figurative interpretation of so much of the Bible. And furthermore, this doctrine results from a failure to rightly divide the word of truth. Okay, Within amillennialism, there is no uh, principle of it. I know that we have some uh, guests uh, from uh, over at Wade. Uh, the, the verse I refer to is 2 Timothy 2.15 when I talk about rightly dividing. And uh, let me just turn over there really quickly. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, this is what uh, Paul says to Timothy. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I think a lot of modern Bibles don't do that verse justice because they'll say something like accurately handling um, or something like, I don't know, rightly teaching, however they may do it. But what the, the Greek says is actually make a straight cut, rightly divide it. And so what we do is we want to make sure that we look at the Bible in its context. If there's a portion of the Bible that is to Israel, we rightly divide the word of truth and understand that's for Israel. For example, I don't think anybody yesterday probably observed the Sabbath. Um, or maybe if you didn't go out and do any work, you may have ate some bacon, right? <laughs> so we don't, we don't apply those Old Testament laws to us today. We rightly divide the word of truth. And what's for us, we properly apply it to us when it is fit. So uh, all millennialism, they have made the kingdom all about us. We are the priests of the kingdom. We are the inheritors of the kingdom. 
But if we look at the Bible, the kingdom was promised to a very particular people. That would be the nation of Israel. The kingdom is not here yet. When the kingdom does come, Christ is going to be the king over Israel. And yet at the same time, he'll ha have authority over the earth as well. Um, but there is a degree to that because there will come a future battle of Gog and Magog. And I could tell you all about that and we'll get there. Time, uh, time will tell uh, as far as all the details there. But we have to discern between those things. If we try to make the kingdom about us, then guess what you have to do? Yeah, you got to spiritualize everything. And when you spiritualize everything, things get very confusing very fast. If we take the Bible literally, we understand, ah, the kingdom was promised Israel. Therefore, we discern between those things. So the church is not the true Israel. The church uh, is the body of Christ, as we call it. Come on in, come on in. And so when it comes to, and th this is uh, the last slide that I have for you today, as we are starting to run out of time. And then I'll open up the floor for questions, because it is Sunday school. I know it's like a sermon, but it's Sunday school. But addressing all these matters of post-millennialism, all-millennialism, the other isms that we're going to get to, what we have to do when it comes to developing our Bible doctrine, we have to find an interpretation that is the most consistent, all right, and uh, answers the most questions. There is always going to be some degree of questions and details left to explain. All right, I've got some pastor friends of mine, some good theologians. All right, uh, Chuck and I, we've spent a lot of time talking about different matters of doctrine and theology. And I'm not going to tell you that I have it all figured out. There is some details left to understand. Now we see through a glass darkly, as Paul mentioned in 1 Corinthians 13. But what we want to do is we need to find the doctrinal view that is the least problematic and that causes the least amount of contradictions and confusion within the church. And my problem with all millennialism and postmillennialism is they leave simply too many problems and questions. And I think that we have better options. That is my position at the end of the day. Uh, so with that, that is my, my view of all millennialism there. If you kind of felt like... Uh, I maybe brushed through some of the matters of the kingdom being spiritual and the church being the true Israel. Go back and watch our post-millennial view. Those are all available for you to watch on the internet. If you look up Mark Bays, you'll find it and you can watch that. We have this whole series recorded for you. Um, and I guess while I'm talking, those of you that may watch this in the future, go back and watch the others because it all builds upon itself. My Sunday school classes learned that it's kind of like math class. If you skip one lesson in math, you're lost forever, right? That's why I struggled in fourth grade. I got sick that one day, and I missed a lesson over long division, and I made a B in my fourth grade math class. I thought my parents were going to wring my neck. All right, with that, do y'all have any questions before I let y'all go today? Anything that maybe I brushed over or maybe you want me to clear up, redefine for you? The floor is open, and we can talk for a minute because those long-winded Sunday school teachers in the back, I tell you what, yes, ma'am. Yes. Um, okay, so I, I, I believe that uh, where you are when you die, that's what you are. You're saved or you're not saved. So, and then the, the resurrection, those that were saved, even though they're dead. Are gonna, so how can the whole world be saved when some people died and they were not saved? Yes, that, that's a good question that you point out. So basically... Um, f for those that maybe couldn't hear on, on our video, um, the, the question is, on the post-millennial view, how could the whole world be saved if there were people that died in the past who weren't saved? Uh, I will say post-millennialism, and I think this is what your question is, it's not a universalism. It doesn't believe that everybody for all time is eventually going to go to heaven. It's just that at some point in the future, under the post-millennial view, everybody that's alive on the earth at that time will be saved. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm glad you asked that because that clears it up. Because I know that can kind of sound confusing when you say the whole world. Does that mean everybody, like all times past or, or not? So thank you. Any other questions before I uh, let y'all go today? What we're going to do, uh, and y'all can just throw out a question anytime you want, but next week we're going to get into post, or sorry, yes, post-tribulational premillennialism. So I know that's a lot there. We use all, all sorts of big words. Basically the view is... Yes, Christ is going to come and reign on earth, but 
the rapture ain't going to be till after the tribulation. So keep the powder dry, right? That's kind of the idea. Uh, we're going to talk about that view. Uh, I, I think that you should keep the powder dry regardless. <laughs> but anyways, uh, that's going to be uh, what we're going to be talking about next week. And then we're going to save the best for last, which is my view, the uh, pre-tribulational, pre-millennial view. Because once again, we're trying to solve problems around here. And uh, I think that's going to be a very uh, good study for us. Anything else before I let y'all go today and have about 10 minutes before service starts? Okay, well, we're going to spend some time in the last days. You know, this is not going to be a study. I think we're going to wrap up fast. I think it's probably going to be maybe that this has been session number five, I think now. Yes, uh, yeah, it's right there on the, on the paper. Uh, we may go a good 15 or 20 on this because just introducing the positions is uh, only the introduction. Uh, then we've got to get into some of the detail. And hopefully by the time it's done, I will be able to map out uh, the book of Revelation for you as well, to where you can actually tackle it on your own and maybe be able to make some sense of this thing, okay? All right, so uh, with that, thank you all all for joining us uh, for this time. And uh, just remember, I gave the opportunity to ask questions. So, so he just talked the whole time. No, I said you can ask questions if you want. Interrupt me at any time. All right, let's uh, close out in a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for this time that we have to look at these important doctrines of the last days. At, uh, at this time, we're having to do kind of a lot of broad jumping around and addressing some of the major points. But Lord, as things progress and we start to get into the actual uh, details of Scripture and verse-by-verse -verse Bible study, may we continue to study to show ourselves approved, Lord, understanding the important principle of rightly dividing, understanding what's for us, what's for Israel, God, what you've done in the past, what you're doing today, and what you're going to do in the future. With that, thank you so much for our gospel of grace in which we're not saved by um, waiting for a future kingdom, enduring the tribulation, or not taking the mark of the beast, but saved by grace through faith in what Christ has done. Because it is His work that uh, put away the sins of the world so that we can be made uh, the righteousness of God. With that, we love you. We thank you so much. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all.